The story of Dan and Margaret Duckhorn is one about a young couple who moved up to Napa in the 70s, rolled up their sleeves and set out to make the very best Merlot in the valley. And this wasn't a hobby for them. In fact, with three young kids, they had to make the business work. I could spell Coors in college, but I couldn't spell Cabernet too much. I didn't know much about it, although we drank a lot of it. We liked well, we, we liked started it, but... drinking a lot of it up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to Berkeley, and, and we, when Margaret was in school, she was in San Francisco. We came up here. This was a place to come and, and, and enjoy getting out of the city. No, we, there were about 20 main wineries in the late 50s, early 60s, and we were the 40th winery in the Napa Valley. So when we came up here, we got in this, these couple guys wanted to grow grapevines in these greenhouses, and we just fell in love with the business and moved up here in 73 with three relatively small children, and um, uh, Margaret was the school nurse in Napa Valley, the only school nurse. They both fell in love with the soft, supple, and silky character of Merlot, and Dan quickly realized that in order to make outstanding quality wine from this varietal, he had to learn from the best. But back then, just to travel to Bordeaux was an undertaking, let alone to get into the famous chateau in Saint-Emilion and Pomerol. Obviously, Petrus was the queen of the yeah. whole thing, but there were a number of them. And the most important thing, I think, was the fact that they were, they all had a style, a little slightly different style, and we followed that. They all had a, maybe a little bit different blend in the Sapage or the Cabernet or Franc or other varieties. So I think it was more important that we spent time, spent time studying uh, their techniques. And I think we spent more time in the cellar than in the field and looking at the barrel regime and how they treated Merlot, which we had come here and it was, Cabernet was king here. Right. And that's how we got started. There was just nobody here doing it. So we sort of learned the business from the ground up, literally, and that, I think that's what really helped out more than anything. When Dan came back from Bordeaux, he made 800 cases of Merlot in his first vintage. He was the first winery in Napa to focus on Merlot. Nobody else was doing it. And then, rather boldly, he priced it so high that it shocked everyone. One of the things that enticed everybody was this $12.50 a bottle, and that was over the top. I mean, people were not even paying seven or eight dollars for a bottle of Cabernet, and except for, of course, some of the real reserves and special lots. But um, $12.50 for a bottle of Merlot, what is this? And how do you pronounce it? And what is this stuff? And $12.50, and all of a sudden, it's funny, that picked everybody's interest, and then that got it going. It was, a, it was a resounding success from day one. The Duckhorns became famous for Merlot amongst wine lovers in California. And following on the heels of this huge local success, they formulated an elaborate marketing plan to conquer the rest of America. We said, well, let's just go to the NFL cities. Oh, yes. National right. football. I mean, they selected, there are 29 or 30 of them. They selected these cities for some reason that we might as well follow the same thing, and that's what we did. That was the marketing plan. That was plan. Our, our marketing it plan totally was to was. follow the National Football League where they were. <laughs> of course, Green Bay was a little wacko, but it was close to Milwaukee, which was drank a lot of beer and, and brandy, so we thought that'd be a great place to go. And you're a big NFL fan, well, too. Well, our winemaker, too, yeah, we were. was a we huge were San Francisco 49ers. Uh, 49ers fan, yeah. so we followed She's the 49ers. Got her red shirt that's right. <laughs> Many winery owners delegate the task of selling their wines to someone else. But I have an enormous amount of respect for Dan Duckhorn for taking on this task himself, which surely was a key reason for the future success of the winery. What are there are three rules of selling, see the people, see the people, see the people. And that's what it was. And in the early days, we could sell direct we never did hire a distributor in California, so we sold directly to the restaurants and the stores. So we load you up my Suburban, load load yeah, car 96 and cases, and I would get it four in the morning, I'd drive down to the peninsula and start, have breakfast and start my way back up, dropping off the cases, shaking hands with each individual buyer and, and uh, owner of the, of the restaurant or the, or the store, and that's how we learn. Mm. 
managing all those customers, making the wine, running a growing business, and raising three kids must have been really quite something. Remember one critical thing, and I can't, I can't overemphasize this, is that compared to today's entrance into entries into this business, and we were the 40th winery, now there are 450 in the Napa Valley. We did it because we had to do it. We had to live off of it. We, there was no, we came here for a job, not a lifestyle, although we have to have a nice place to have a job, but it wasn't here, the lifestyle was not at all in our goal. Our goal was to see if we could get this thing profitable as quickly as possible and actually uh, make a real decent living and hopefully in the long run, cash out over many, many years. It not, took us 10 not years like today. before we got out of the red. I've heard a number of inspiring stories from the Napa Vintners, but the Duckhorn strikes a chord and I'm full of admiration for them. But stories aside, their Merlot is still the benchmark in Napa. It scores in the high 90s and is always reliably good. In fact, on a number of occasions, it's been served at the White House and at the inaugurations of new presidents. And surely in terms of accolades, it doesn't get any better than that.